War is a horrible, brutal tragedy that most often points brother against brother in a horrific conflict that leaves families and lives broken and most often ends with the victors standing atop the ashes they created, hoping that more men will not come along and do the same tragedies that they committed. So now that I said that, I can make fun of it. A lot of people underestimate like how many wars there's actually been in human history. The longest war of which being over 700 years and several wars being over 100 years in themselves. However, even fewer people seem to know about the shortest official war that ever happened in human history, which was 38 minutes long. And since I'm doing this weird like sort of history teacher stuff, I figured who better to tell you about a weird wacky thing that people certainly died in than me. Like trust me, this is a real thing that happened and it was hilarious. This war known as the Anglo-Zanzibar War is so wild because of how short it was, how stupid the fighting was to begin with, and how gentlemanly the British acted during the whole ordeal. And while we're on the topic of gentlemen, what's one thing that every gentleman has in common? That's right, being disgusting. That was until today's sponsor came along, Manscaped. And while sometimes it can be cool to be gross and a barbarian and all of that, sometimes you wanna be a bit more hygienic. See, I was scared initially because it advertises it as a safe razor technology. So I tried it out to trim my neck first of all, which as you can see, even after a day is still pretty thin. I was so impressed with this that I pulled the razor up to look in the mirror and accidentally cut out a bald spot in the side of my beard and I wish I was kidding. So the razor works really well, a little too well if you're an idiot like I am. To be honest, I don't know what kind of hoodoo voodoo magic they put into it to make it work as well as it does. I just know that it works. Specifically, Manscaped sent me the perfect package 3.0, which included their lawnmower razor as well as some other goodies. As you can see, not only is the design sleek and cool, but it's also waterproof, has a handy light because, you know, that's necessary for some things. On top of that, the perfect package also includes toner and deodorant because, like, let's be honest, fellas, if you're going to put deodorant on your armpits, you want to put it other places. Not only that, but I'm able to hook you all up with a special deal. If you go to manscaped.com and use the promo code Windagoon, you will not only get this package as well as others for 20% off of your first order with free international shipping, but you will also be receiving two gifts, one of which being this handy little carry bag, which is great. I've been using it as well as a pair of boxers that are so well made. It feels like someone actually cared for once. So once again, if you're interested, use the promo code Windagoon at the link in the description below to get access to 20% off your first order today and turn a very, very, very scary process into a hygiene standard that it should be. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. It means the most to me and you all are the best and we are back to the video. Without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get into it and go through all the details of what happened that day. But as always, Thank you for watching. The Anglo-Zanzibar War occurred on August 27th of 1896. However, there's some background you need to know before we get into the actual events that happened in that half hour. See, Zanzibar Island, where this took place, is a rather small island off the coast of East Africa, which is today part of Tanzania. See, in the 1800s, there was this thing Britain really liked to do with lesser developed countries, where they, uh, you know, just kind of like, like, like took them and Zanzibar was no exception. However, instead of being like an actual colony that they had to pay into, it was more so kind of like Britain was there and provided like security stuff and then took their resources but didn't really have to give them anything and just kind of made sure they didn't get like too crazy. And without going into all the details, most of it just came down that Britain took resources from the people of Zanzibar and then told them some stuff that they could and couldn't do. Like in 1858, whenever Zanzibar declared its independence from the nation that previously controlled it, Britain was just kind of like, all right, that's cool. Get back to work. However, there wasn't really anything too intrusive that Britain was doing until in 1873 when they told the at the time leader, Bargash bin Said, that they had to get rid of slavery within the country. See, around the late 1800s, slavery was kind of dying out everywhere, and most industrialized nations were making a big push to stop it, and pretty much all of them were able to abolish slavery rather peacefully, unless you're the United States and you have to have a war over it. And this is something that the people of Zanzibar had a problem with, as it was one of their primary exports. 
It was around this time that Zanzibar had built their capital known as Zanzibar Town. There were more smaller structures around it, however the primary structures of Zanzibar Town consisted of the palace, the harem, and something known as the House of Wonders that were all wooden structures connected to each other through bridges. While a palace and harem were pretty standard for African kingdoms in the 1800s, the House of Wonders was interesting as it was a place of worship that is supposedly the first building in East Africa to have electricity. And then in front of all that was a really big lighthouse. Much of the funding that Zanzibar received to do this type of stuff came from the British government. So whenever the British government said, hey, you got to get rid of slavery and we'll give you a ton of money, the government was fine with it. However, a lot of the people were not. It got even worse in the years following this as a little country you may have heard of called Germany started to get into a trade fight with Britain and Zanzibar was one of the primary locations of that. See, Britain owned land around the area and Germany owned land around the area and they all wanted a piece of the money that trade routes were bringing in. So Zanzibar was kind of a battleground before it became a, you know, actual battleground. It got really bad whenever the new ruler that came to power, Ali bin Said, in 1890, decided that he was going to be entirely pro-Britain. He put up rulings such as Britain was able to decide what Zanzibar could and couldn't trade, and Britain had veto power for whatever future ruler of Zanzibar would come along. People over time got really upset with Britain pretty much telling them what to do. So in 1893, whenever the new leader, Hamad bin Thuwani, was put into power and he was pretty much a British puppet, people got pretty upset. As a matter of fact, riots began occurring around Zanzibar, to which the British government then put 1,000 troops around him in the British palace. So there's a lot of tension happening in the country, a lot of tension happening around the palace area, and then this is when everything goes downhill. At 11.40 a.m. on August the 25th of 1896, Thuwani died unexpectedly. So this now meant that the throne was open. However, according to the ruling mention that was set up in 1890, Britain had to approve whoever the new ruler would be. That same day, as a matter of fact, a couple of hours later, a man walked into the palace named Khalid bin Bargash. This guy was the 29-year-old nephew of Thuwani, and some people suspect to this day that maybe he murdered his uncle in order to take control. Hence the whole, he was already in the area and his uncle died unexpectedly thing. This guy immediately moved into the palace without the approval of the British government and said that he's now Sultan. Which is pretty much like king, but like... Britain's the real king, so you can't be king. You can be a sultan, though. That works. Britain did not care for this one bit. As a matter of fact, they had a candidate put forward that they were just going to throw into power called Haman bin Muhammad, who was just kind of standing there like, oh, well, I guess that guy's sultan now. I'll explain what these ships are in a second. But the moment that this happened, the British diplomat by the name of Basil Cove came onto the scene to try to reason with Khalid. See, Khalid actually did this same thing three years ago after the previous ruler died. He had came and tried to take power, and the British government told him that's a really bad idea, I wouldn't be trying that, to which Khalid backed off. So now, Basil Cove, a diplomat, comes again and tries to tell Khalid that this is still a bad idea and he still shouldn't do it. His precise words was Khalid needs to think carefully in this emotional time. What was not immediately apparent to the British government, but became immediately apparent, was that Khalid did not come alone. Instead, he brought about 2,800 soldiers with him. Now, several of these, around 700, were Zanzibar troops in the area who were sympathetic for his cause. You know, the whole, we don't like Britain, let's get Britain out kind of thing. Which, again, the fact that he showed up with all of these people leads to the belief that he probably killed his uncle. And as for what the other ones of the 2,800 were, Mostly just locals who he gave guns and told to follow him, so, you know, that's cool. And also, Khalid took control of the Zanzibar Navy, which consisted of one dinghy called the HMS Glasgow, which was a small yacht that was built for the Sultan of Zanzibar by Britain as a gift, which Khalid converted into a makeshift warboat by simply strapping a few cannons and a machine gun to the front of the yacht. Britain, treating this as an act of war, as Khalid technically probably overthrew the Zanzibar government, had on their side about 900 loyal Zanzibar soldiers, at least loyal to Britain, 
and about 150 British sailors. So pretty much what happens in the beginning is Basil Cove keeps trying to tell Khalid to stop. As a matter of fact, Khalid's in the palace. So I'm going to put a K right here so we know where that dude's at. To which Khalid keeps making things worse. At 2.30 p.m. the same day, and remember, Thuwani died like three hours ago, Khalid holds a burial for Thuwani in the royal gardens, and then 30 minutes later, crowns himself as Sultan of Zanzibar. Khalid during this time kept doing things like he tried to message the United States in order to get the United States to come help by going, uh, I, I'm Sultan and Britain, Britain's gonna shoot me. Oh no, help. To which the response from America is, the Sultan is not recognized by Her Majesty's government, therefore we do not recognize you as a Sultan. Sorry. Which is pretty much the equivalent of the United States going, uh, America can't come to the phone right now, uh, g get wrecked. And the messages from Cove kept getting funnier. Like it went from like, don't, don't you, don't you go in that palace? Don't, don't you crown yourself? And then he crowns himself and they're like, don't, d d don't keep that crown on. I also just realized that his name is Basil Cave, not Cove. I, I can't wait for the comments to find out about that one. And Caves messages to the British were also equally as funny. Like for example, he had all the flags on all the ships lowered to half mast as respect for Thuwani who had just died. But along with that same message, he goes, also remember the new Sultan's not a real Sultan. He doesn't count, don't listen to him. If he tries to tell you something, it's a trick. Close your ears. This thing went on all night, and by the next day on the 26th of August at 10 a.m., the British Royal Navy that was there consisted of the Raccoon, the Thrush, and the Sparrow, which may sound like really cute names, but I want to remind you they looked like this. Also, to remind you through this entire thing, Zanzibar looked like this, and the British Empire looked like this. Are you starting to see why it was a 38-minute war? <laughs> At around 2 p.m. that day, the Admiral arrived on the command ship, known as the St. George, and gave an ultimatum to Khalid. He said if Khalid was not out of the palace and his stupid fake Sultan flag taken down by 9 a.m. the next day, they would use these three to absolutely decimate all of this. The exact words used by the British government whenever the brigade asked what they can do to take Zanzibar back was, quote, take it back by whatever measures necessary. This didn't only give Khalid ample time in order to surrender, but it also allowed the British government to come along on the sides of the shores and begin evacuating the surrounding town. There were smaller boats around here conducting rescue operations like that, but these are the big four, so they're the only ones I have drawn because I'm not an artist as you can you get it. Khalid was totally quiet until 8 a.m. the next day and remember his deadline is 9 a.m. when he requested a parlay directly to Cave. Cave said the only way that he was getting a parlay or anything of the sort was to step down. At 8.30 a.m., again we're getting close, Khalid sends a message to the British Navy saying he does not believe that they will fire on them, to which the exact words that Cave said back were, we certainly will. <laughs> That's what I mean by this is so hilariously gentlemanly. Like, the British Navy has their flags at half-mast for the country they're about to bombard. And when they're just talking back and forth like pin pounds, like, oh, you won't shoot me? I, I certainly will. If, if you make me, <laughs> we're going to kill you. So sure enough, as pretty much everyone expected, 9 a.m. rolled around, the flag was still up, and Khalid was still in the palace. To which, at precisely 9 a.m., the Admiral gave the order to fire. To which, at precisely 9.02 a.m., the Raccoon, Thrush, and Sparrow all simultaneously began firing on the capital. What followed was 38 minutes of noise. <laughs> See, here in the capital of Zanzibar, they had a few cannons and a couple machine guns, but I'm once again stressing these things look like this. So what pretty much happened is, like, they probably saw the first few shots, and then it was just 38 minutes of explosions. 
The reason this war is cited as 38 minutes is because it's often considered a war can begin whenever the first shots are fired. Like for example, in the American Revolution, they say the shots at Lexington and Concord signified the opening of the revolution. And then it's also believed by several whenever the flag at the enemy's capital is taken down, that is the end of the war. So for example, people say that World War II ended whenever Russia got to Germany and took down the flag from the Reichstag. So what happened is at 9.02 a.m. they started shooting and at 9.40 a.m. they quit shooting and then the flag was gone as was the palace and everything else. And they're like, all right, boys, war's over. Reports vary about when, but at some point during the explosions, Khalid ran out the back door along with a few of his advisors and left all of his loyalists and the poor people with rifles to stay behind and die for him, like any nobleman would. And when it was over, you know, the flag's gone, uh, the palace and the harem were on fire. Surprisingly, the building full of 19th century electricity, the House of Wonders, wasn't on fire and was actually pretty okay, so that's... You know, something, I guess. However, one of the most amazing parts about all this. So remember the Glasgow I mentioned? Like, this little dinghy that was a yacht with a cannon strapped to the front of it? Well, at 9.05 a.m., three minutes of these things going just full cyclic on the cannons. The Glasgow made a flanking maneuver around the back and tried to go straight for the St. George. Which consisted... <laughs> of them screaming like a kamikaze going straight for the battleship firing a few rounds before the saint george immediately sank it and watched it go underwater but because it was a shallow port it just went a little bit underwater and the masts were still sticking up so the crew of the saint george felt bad for them got in their boats drove over and pulled all of them in and rescued them and they weren't even taken as like prisoners of war or anything they were just sitting on the saint george looking at him and they're like we we should probably do something <laughs> also to be even cuter about it as the glasgow was going underwater they hoisted the british flag as a way to say like no no okay we we changed teams we changed teams there was also a small ground unit that the british had sent onto shore that arrived at the palace at 9 45 and no one shot back at them no one attacked them because again everyone was either running uh on fire or dead so they kind of got there to the palace and they're like oh i i guess we won that, that's neat. So technically the longest that this war could possibly be is 45 minutes because if you consider the call to fire at 9 a.m. to be the opening and the ending whenever the soldiers got to the capital and were like, all right, it's ours now, that's 9 to 9 45, so 45 minutes. Whereas if you say that the actual shots fired and the flag going down, which was 9.02 to 9.40, 38 minutes, is the actual war then you know that you've got like seven minutes of difference i like the 38 minute one because it's funnier by at least seven minutes all in all during the 38 minutes the british government had fired 500 shells 4100 machine gun rounds and 1000 rifle rounds the zanzibar suffered roughly 500 casualties and it's believed the majority of them came from the two biggest buildings being on fire whereas britain suffered one casualty which was a petty officer on the thrush who during the fire injured himself somehow but he got better so <laughs> and that's it that's all they lost in this war also remember how i said the surrounding city had been evacuated well there were several looters who were you know using the evacuation time as a chance to steal stuff and 20 of them got killed in the bombardment as well. So technically 520 Zanzibars or Zanzibari. The country doesn't exist anymore. I don't know what they're called. The, the people of Zanzibar, that sounds good. So as soon as the British government got to shore, their immediate goal was to put out the fires here, which took a couple hours, meaning that the fires lasted longer than the war itself. Pretty much the aftermath of this was Khalid got away to the Germanic East Africa and Germany and Britain, you know, weren't the best of friends during this time. So Germany said that they would give Khalid asylum from Britain. 
And then in 1916, during World War I, whenever Britain was on its campaign through Africa, they actually found Khalid by some chance, to which they brought him back, tried him, and punished him to exile on St. Helena, which, fun fact, is the same island that Napoleon was exiled to. So, the more you know. Not only that, but after everything was said and done, the British government taxed the people of Zanzibar for the cost of the ammunition they used to shoot at them which has got to be the most British thing I have ever heard. All in all, of course, the lives that were lost is a tragedy, but I think it's interesting to look at history through a certain optics that's entertaining in order to try to better understand it. Because there have been several wars throughout history of what happens whenever an industrial nation meets a nation that is struggling to maintain any form of industry. However, the, you know, offset side war normally isn't as extreme as 38 minutes so hopefully you enjoyed this little walk through memory lane and hopefully it wasn't entirely boring and sincerely and from the bottom of my heart thank you for watching i enjoy this kind of like weird nerdy stuff um and i'm glad that hopefully you all enjoyed as well or at least if you've stuck to this long in the video i hope that you enjoyed it uh it's really cool for you guys to you know be a part of this and to watch this and it's great uh, i want to say a huge thank you to the person who is editing this for me honey honey you are fantastic uh she's made all the funny meme videos of me so i thought it would be cool to you know uh give her a shot with this one because again caitlin is still doing a ton of the editing for me and she will in the future uh but you know she's busy i'm busy too so it kind of works to break up the workload as much as possible so honey i hope you enjoyed this uh thank you so much for doing this it's really cool of you thank you all so much for watching it means the most um you guys have been great this has been enjoyable for me like this channel and i enjoy doing this kind of stuff it's fun uh to just like take old historical stuff and point at them um so thank you all so much for watching thank you so much to my subscribers it really does mean the most. I'm at a number I can't comprehend now, 200, 240, I think 240,000, which is over the moon and I'm really thankful for it. You guys have given me opportunities I couldn't imagine for like the ad earlier in the video um, and just things, things such as, uh -huh, huh, um, and that's really cool. Just thank you guys for that. Um, you give me opportunities I couldn't imagine and it means the most. So thank you to my patrons too, because well, above all because like the fact that you guys support me in the way that you do is just mind-blowing and it, I, it really gets to me every day like wow people really watch this uh and they donate to it and it means the most so thank you all for that and thank you to my top tier patrons as you can see here it's really cool i hear my dog barking downstairs and i'm scared now um but thank you to all my top tier patrons thank you all so much for being the best it really does mean the world um so thank you all for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next video. If you're interested, part eight of the Conspiracy Theory Iceberg will be coming out soon. But if you're not interested in any of that, just thank you for watching. Thank you so much for being here. And I will see you in the next one.